Sometimes in life, when things get tough, easy to forget, cause we are busy, busy to It is definitely going to be an interactive session and uh, you would be involved in asking questions, making very, very short comments. I, I know a few speakers here who are, are very good in giving lectures uh, and I'm going to try and uh, encourage you to be uh, economical with your points when it comes to making a point. But you're welcome to actually with each and every one of the speakers. The speakers, to make it easier for everybody, we've got name tags in front of them, so you can at least relate to your name. And during the period when we, uh, we interact, we could have more conversation with them. If you look at the agenda of this program, we do have refreshments at 6 .30. Please don't expect vodka. And uh, sometimes uh, the African beer. I'm sorry about that. But we're just going to use the uh, stainless tea coffee and we have missed out water. But that is going to be supplied as well. So, and after that, then we move on to talk about the MDG and the post 2015 agenda, which is the key point here. Um, within the first speakers, I have uh, one apology. Councillor June Nelson, who is the Vice Chair of Ben Labour, uh, has um, unexpectedly been unable to turn up. Well, we have the able hand of Kingsley Ever, who is in that corner, who is going to talk to us about the role Ben Labour is attempting to play in terms of civil engagement uh, and political participation of, uh, of uh, the diasporans. Um, and from that, if you feed in into what they can do in terms of influencing the next MDG. Participation is a key word. If you do not participate, you have no way of addressing any issues. Okay. Um, gratitude to uh, Liz. Um, maybe Liz can introduce herself better than I would ever do. But, uh, we have a packed program, as you can see. But what is what is key to this is that at the end of the event, that the international development department, yes which we have the shadow ministers and shadow secretary of state going to hear, that they would hear loud and clear what the African experts and NGOs like ourselves and other diasporans are going to say in terms of what they want to see in the new Millennium Development Goal. There has been a lot of talk about the successes of the previous Millennium Development Goal, or the lack of it. And there were also the whole from the previous uh, exercise was the absence of consultation uh, with the people who are supposed to be the primary uh, beneficiaries of the MDG, which are the Africans, the Asians, the so-called uh, development, developing countries, and um, etc. So the critique of that, the central point of that critique is that they were not taken on board in a serious manner in terms of bringing forward, elucidating their view of these countries on daily basis, have anything up to 80% Chinese men going down to Africa. And that is what triggered my interest. Then I looked a bit further into that. And found that the type of contract 
they hold while they are working in Africa. When you compare it to the type of contract we hold when we work for the United Nations, it's completely different. When we work in the United Nations, they consider it a war theater in which you have to leave that theater every six weeks to recuperate and come back. But the Chinese situation, they could stay there for any time to two years without leaving the theater. So what happens? They start engaging with, you know, with local people. And what sort of people do they primarily engage with? They start coming in contact with African women and young girls. And it's the most vulnerable of the African young girls and women that they are in contact. Those who come to sweep, sweep their compound, domestic servants, hawkers who move around to sell bananas and grabnuts and peanuts and all those things to them. These are the sort of people they come in contact with. And we know that the ability of those people to negotiate sexual relationship with the Chinese people who carry dollars is disproportionate. And what do we get? We start getting these girls pregnant. And the typical example happened in, um, in Kenya, where a young girl never knew what sex was, but became pregnant. And she never knew what was happening to her until the family became, became anxious and found out that she was pregnant. Asked what it was, doesn't know. But first and foremost, economic migrants in the time that it was fashionable to be economic migrants, <coughs> of course, not anymore. And I've seen this magnificent country, which is now our home, uh, develop in a most extraordinary way because our community, the African diaspora, provides so much to Britain. And we are therefore no longer, in my view, power-wise, we probably still are not in the center of power, despite the fact that we've had, we've got 77 uh, peers and members of parliament. Huge number. Unbelievable that Paul and I got elected. Who would ever have believed this by 2014? But actually, there is still more to do. And I think the business community is absolutely critical to the success of any political engagement. And creating jobs, providing opportunities, is, I believe, a really important way forward. And the very present thing that you like to hear, how many people are Nigerians here? Can I see my short one? Mm -hmm. okay. The diaspora voting rights and the diaspora commission law has just been passed five years. <laughs> Something that we spent over 10 years fighting for. Yeah. So I got an email from Paola Dimeji, one of the people representing us that was passed about five years ago. So I am very, very excited. Yes. Welcome. So yes. it shows that we diasporans have a role to play in national development. Not just in UK, but in Nigeria. And this is what I've been um, trying to advocate that we have to be involved in the decision making body of this country. That's why I'm a school governor in Croydon and the chair of Chatteris for Personal Development in Lambeth. And I'm also the vice chair for Nigeria for Labour. And the reason why we started Nigeria for Labour is that when you look at the history of Nigerians in UK, historically, we've been voting for Labour. Yeah. That's the truth, yes or no? Yes. Now, we are the Nigerians. This is what the government officials are saying. We have the individual Nigerians here and there, but collectively, where are they? So that's the reason why we've come together and say we are going to make our voice known and support everybody who has an aspiration to become a politician. And I'm very, very delighted to say that as at the last election, the local government election, we have 40 Nigerian councillors. Mm. And this year we even have a 19-year-old person who is a councillor. So you see that where we are coming from, it's not done badly. And we will continue to ensure that once we get our issues into the, the Labour's manifesto, we'll then have to fight to ensure that they implement it as Labour Party policy. So we have a serious job to do, and we want people to assist us and join us in that struggle. It's 10 months to go to the general election, in the middle of the general election. As you would expect, as Labour Party members, we want to see Labour elected at the next election. It's a serious issue, this one. I don't think this country can afford, and I don't think this country can afford, and black people can afford, another
condemn or whichever Tory-led government. And this country definitely cannot afford a UKIP-Tory alliance government in the next election. So for those of us, or you, sorry, that may not have voted, I voted in first of Chinta, I haven't been voting, obviously, Labour ever since. You've got to get out and vote. So, so obeying Labour's job in the run-up to the next election, our main task will be to encourage black people to vote Labour. We will be out there in the community in meetings like this, canvassing and arguing as to why you should vote Labour, as to why you don't need another Conservative government. There will be public meetings like this one. We'll be speaking about what we want to do with international development. Because Bay and Labour have access to the, the um, Labour, <coughs> Labour Party, we have access to the deputy leader, we have access to Jim Murphy. If Joe wants a meeting with Jim Murphy, he just needs to get on the Twitter or whatever else and ask for a meeting with Jim Murphy on the issues concerned um, international development. So please get involved, get active, and I don't want to see people coming out of this meeting, Joe, today without deciding on at least four or five key points that we need to address for the future. Three or four key points that you want to see the four Bain representatives who will be sitting in Labour's policy forum meeting in July. But what are the causes of the problems? Why are indigenous people losing their heritage? Why are they losing their identities? Why are women suffering from Asia to America, to, to North America, to everywhere, to the Middle East? Why are children dying and suffering? What are the root causes? What happened before Africa was colonized? What are the problems? Are we ready to bring out a, a, a fearless leadership that will tackle, that will face those evils of the past? Are we ready to do that, or are we just going to continue talking about it and policy for policy and bringing one department or the other and voting? Uh, how are we going to solve it? How are we going to be bold and face it? Challenges we face as indigenous people all over the world are profound, and we know that. But what we are going to do about it? It has been often been noted that the core concerns of indigenous people, both at national and international levels, should be recognized and in a clear, <coughs> forthright, and honest manner. There is therefore a, a universal reference.
I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it.